They knew that the owners had broken the law. They knew that the courts had ruled the owners had broken the law. They knew the Crown Solicitor in New South Wales had advised the government the owners had broken the, had broken the law. The government had threatened to prosecute John Brown because he'd broken the, the law. Everything pointed to them breaking the law, and here they were under police fire. The miners were under police fire. And I don't think any section of the Australian population in the whole of our history has ever been put through anything like that. I woke up one morning and it was still dark and the wind was howling in from the North Sea and I could hear this clatter of hobnail boots <coughs> going up the tram tracks. And I realised then that was mine as in a very cold winter's morning going to their work. And uh, <coughs> my reaction was to snuggle back down into the bed and be glad that I was not one of them and didn't dream <coughs> at that stage that eventually I would become one of them. Uh, I was reared next door here, and over the road uh, there was a young chap, he married this country girl and uh, brought her there. And one day Dad was coming home from work, and uh, the husband was telling her Dad later that she sung out to him and says, Oh, come out here and see the little black man with the tin teapot on his hat. And that, uh, the first little black man with the tin teapot she'd seen, and that was the the miner's lamp. All employees had to travel, some by bicycles, but the old men generally walked. And, some, and sometimes it was miles and miles to get to the pit. And uh, to go to work down the mine could be up to two, three and more miles. And the seam that I started, the work pit I started at, the gradient was about one in 12. Now walking down wasn't so bad, but it end of the shift, the aged men felt it most trying to struggle out after filling probably 20 or more tonnes of coal, plus getting it, of course, out of boreholes with hand, hand machines, and very exhausting. They were working in water because the seam was, was uh, damp. It was a virgin seam and the water, they were sometimes up to their knees. And I thought, my God, what, this is terrible. And by the end of the day, they were, they'd had it, but they struggled out. And I think sometimes one of the reasons for some of the many strikes was they just hated going down because of the, the, the arduousness or the, the heavy work. I used to watch Dad coming through the bush after working uh, the full time at the, the pit. And when he'd come in the yard, his cheeks were pra practically meeting with exhaustion. And I used to, uh, to think, oh, you know, how dreadful that a man should have to work to reach that stage physically. So when, as soon as I'd see him coming through, I'd run inside and I'd make an egg flip. And I, I'd meet him on the back veranda and give him this egg flip to give him the strength to get washed and get his dinner. And he was always so grateful. Well, Lang, Jack Lang, I think, is correct in his book, The Great Bust, when he said that the depression in Australia didn't start with the fall in rural prices, it started in the coal industry. I told you, pits were closing down as early as 1927, retrenching. It was quite clear that an industry developed to produce 12 million tonnes for an 8 million tonne market uh, was going to run into trouble. At a conference in Canberra in February, the federal government of Bruce, the state government of Bavan, the colliery proprietors asked the miners to accept a wage reduction <coughs> and other conditions to, to be surrendered. Now the miners were working under a federal award which had 12 months to run and it's illegal to work for less than an award. And the governments and the co-landers are asking the miners to break the law. Well, we were only getting 
four and eight pence a tonne, which in our pit was all right, but in a lot of pits was just a living. And uh, uh, we, we thought, well, if they take that off us, they'll be taking a bit more of us, and that's how it developed into a... It was never the intention of the miners to be on strike for 15 months. Not a strike, it was a lockout. They locked us out. And everyone got a notice, uh, 14 days from here on, you are no longer required. And that lasted for 16 months. Nobody would believe in those days that we were going into a depression. Everybody said it'll blow over in a few weeks. That was what was the idea when we got the tickets. We'd lived in almost a slum place in Browns Lane and Curry. And the cheap rent enabled my parents to get a deposit, have a new home built. And they succeeded in getting the new home built on a bank loan, which was as good a home as there was in Curry at that time. But when the lockout came on, it wasn't possible to maintain the payments on that home. And eventually <coughs> they lost it, something that embittered my mother for the rest of her life. But. Uh, each, it, each time that my old man voted against going back to work in that 15 months, he knew he was losing that home. The feeding of Colleen was the problem, and uh, as I didn't have sufficient milk for her, we decided to give her cow's milk to make up the leeway, and it uh, disagreed with her, so she, she got uh, upset in the bowels. She was very, very sick with it. Well. Uh, then came the problem of what to do because we didn't have the money to just go out and buy what we thought. Anyhow, I took her to the doctors and he suggested putting her on lactogen. Well, then the problem of getting lactogen. So this is one of the questions that the uh, men's organisation was taking up, getting food for babies as well as the food for the family. And uh, that was the time that uh, one, one point Henry was dealing with when they grabbed him and battened him out of the, the police grounds, threw him through the fence out to where the unemployed workers were all standing around. So I'm getting more confirmed in my idea that the strike was going on too far, that the conditions people were living under, the, 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 the rations weren't sufficient. And uh, when I'd met a few more of these chaps, Sharky, uh, He'd been here, Miles, General Secretary, and uh, Ted Docker became, he was a wharfie. Uh, Roach, uh, another fellow. And Tom Wright had been to the Soviet Union, wrote, written a book, Russia Today, and I read that. So I thought now it's time to move on. So I joined the Communist Party. Henry, of course, he uh, carried on with his political and, and industrial life. And um, the... Uh, UWM, was it, Henry? Yeah. Unemployed Workers' Movement was set up. So I went down to one of their meetings and uh, joined, and I got uh, the secretary job for my pains. Well, I found it very exhausting, but uh, when your mind slipped back to why you were there, the reasons, and uh, the brutality you'd seen by the uh, police and uh, men bashed up for just merely asking for a loaf of bread almost, well, you just get that in, embroiled in it. You're so annoyed, you're so... Uh, well, you, you really you want to do mad things. You just want to get out there and, and make yourself felt. The federal election took place in October, and the Labor Party looked like being a winner. And Red Ted Theodore, the deputy leader of the Parliamentary Labor Party, addressed the minor central council, and despite our straightened circumstances <clears throat> talked them into giving a thousand pounds to have the Labor government re-elected, that the courageous Labor Party, Labor government, would ensure that the mines would be reopened on pre-lockout pre conditions, and my boss, John Brown, was going to be prosecuted for an illegal lockout. Well, they got the thousand pounds, they got the posters out, they got elected, and then immediately told us to get the best conditions we could because the bosses couldn't do anything to help us. Around about December, 1929, the government decided to reopen 
three of the mines with volunteer labour. The uh, first mine selected for reopening was Rothbury. On the Friday, a special train came in with free labourers and uh, all sorts of building materials and uh, tradesmen. The uh, free labourers were to be accommodated in tents and the um, police, who had been guarding the property for a couple of weeks, uh, they were um, billeted in mostly in the colliery office. It um, was amazing the speed with which they put that, uh, those buildings up. The train arrived on the Thursday, and by the Friday night all the buildings were just about complete, plumbing and all. Of course, the peaceful atmosphere of the lockout had disappeared by this time, and everybody was outraged uh, by this move, and huge meetings were called on the Sunday night right through the coal fields, <clears throat> and the decisions were made to go to. Rothbury. I think they were in a dilemma because it, we were getting nowhere. So they put this Rothbury um, uh, stud on, or stud I suppose you'd call it, and uh, we of course all religiously obeyed the order and marched out there in hundreds and hundreds. And uh, we went out the night before and the Grace and her mother and all the other women were on the School of Arts corner as we marched around. We were waving, hello, a bit, you know, a bit of fun like. Well, we got the Rothbury <clears throat> as the sun was rising. And I remember I was puzzled where the sun was. It wasn't where I thought it should have been. Blood red ray shooting through the bush and as it rose, you could see this curtain of dust rising up from all these blokes marching with their pit boots and the bloody wild pipe band leading us on, you vibrated with excitement. <clears throat> we met the Cessna blokes on the top of the hill and there was nobody there to organise the blasted thing. There's no union <clears throat> executives uh, there at all. There was a bit of a cover there, a gully rang up here and we thought we'd get up there and we, with some idea of getting near the scab so we could, might do something with them, you know. The Cessna uh, miners were marching up and down, protesting. The Rothbury paddock that the mine was in was very well covered with tea tree scrub. We got the shock of our lives when you see what was in that scrub. <laughs> well, back on the road, the colliery fence was there, and the pipe band turned in and a young white-faced policeman came out and stared at us and everybody stared back at him and he kept saying, you can't come in here, boys, you can't come in here. And Sheridan had his foot on the bottom rail of the fence. He said, look, we don't want any trouble with you blokes. All we do is want to talk to these scabs and get them out of here so there won't be any trouble. But the trouble was bubbling then because the return soldiers could see army tents in the compound to house the scabs. And it wouldn't matter what anybody had done that day, they were going to try and get in there to destroy those tents. The coppers was lined up there and there was no shooting at that time. And he just walked up and hit this fellow down the face with his baton and the blood spurted all over his face. Well, that really upset me. And a few more, I suppose. And uh, that's when I thought I'd uh, have a go to get inside. And there's a policeman had an old bloke down, nobody retired early at the pits in those days. He was into this bloke with a baton. His face was a mask of blood and obviously unconscious. But he was still working on him with this baton. And the, the, the policeman's face was just a bloody mask of fury, you know, sheer hatred and rage. I couldn't, couldn't believe that they would go so far with their attitude towards human beings. I'd experienced the 1917 strike when the Aberdeer Extended Mine had scabs. There was a big meeting call and then there was a fracas there. Even returned soldiers got knocked over then. During the war they'd be come back. But at Rothbury, when we got through the fence at Rothbury, all types, young and old, and then the, the mounted troopers came in and they mercifully 
with their batons flogged age men. You just can't describe what that was like. And the mounted police couldn't stop them. <clears throat> and it was, that was where it looked as though the miners could get out into the open. And it was then that the shooting started. Uh, the funny part about it, you know, I suppose all of us that have never took part in wars, we, we wonder what would be the feeling. Well, it was a strange thing to me. I never felt frightened. I don't think anybody did, although we ducked for cover. But uh, Arthur Morby standing out the street saying, shoot me, you bastard, shoot me. And I sunk. I raised up and said, get yourself out of the road, they will shoot you, you're invited to shoot you. And uh, they didn't shoot him, I'll have to live a long time after that. I always think about it with a bit of humour at uh, I Thorpe, he lives in Western still, I think, and uh, he said, uh, we better get out and there was a bullet whining overhead, you know, in this bit of scrub we were in. And uh, I said, yeah, there, that bullet, you can hear it whine a bit, you know, the bullet come through. And he said, uh, I said, Ike, that's, uh, that's another one, another bullet, you know, as we run, you know, through to get back out on the road. And he said, no, that's the same one. He reckoned we'd caught up with it. <laughs> I always think about that, they would laugh, you know. As we were getting through the slip rail fence, obviously retreating away from the bashes as we were going on, this policeman fired. He could have hit me, but he hit Bob. And when I seen what happened, he had, his hat was off and the blood streaming down his face. He said, fill up again, you bastard, have another go. A car came towards the gate <clears throat> and the cry went up. It was Weaver, the most detested bloke amongst the miners that you could think about. And the rush came on again. <clears throat> and a bloke, Ashcroft, the goalkeeper in the Curry Soccer Club, <clears throat> smashed the window of the car in with a waddy, knocked the chauffeur out, another bloke, Roger Mabry, who was killed in Killingworth Colliery later on, was carving the tyres up with a knife. And uh, the police came out, shooting in all directions <clears throat> to protect the blokes in the car. Well, unfortunately, it wasn't Weaver. It was uh, Bob Jack, the mines inspector, somebody that the miners had a great respect and liking for. <clears throat> but this was where the more serious <clears throat> fighting took place. There were miners and police rattling all over the road and inside the compound, police farther back shooting <clears throat> as hard as uh, they could, and that's where Norman Brown was shot. The shooting was going on quite, uh, you know, quite frequent. And when I saw what was taking place, I went over, and here was Brown lying there with this gaping stomach wound. Terrible thing. Uh, it made me sick to look at it. And I realised then that his time was up. And I felt very sorry to think that, you know, for him, but it could have been anybody. And my brother Mick was present. And uh, he accompanied him to the hospital. But Mick, talking to Mick about it, he says, poor fellow, poor bugger, he said. Uh, he died before we got there. There was lots of things happened when we first went in, that, uh, that we had to get out or get shot, one of the two. And I was one of the unlucky ones that got shot. I'd seen the uh, car go into the colliery paddock and uh, the, the cameraman, losing his camera, the miners kicked it up, thinking the car had uh, the Minister for Mines, Weaver. Uh, but it wasn't Mr Weaver at all, it was Bob Jack, the coal inspector. And then at that time, there was shooting going on at the gate. And looking down, I saw this chap get hit. I didn't know he hit to the throat until later, but he just spiralled around and fell like a stick. I was running down <clears throat> towards the fence 
and could have touched a bloke from Richmond Lane, Wally Woods, <coughs> who I worked with, and I saw this bloke rise out of a bush in police uniform, steadied the revolver, deliberately aimed at Wally Woods and shot him through the throat. Uh, Wally Woods was, uh, uh, oh, he was only fires that door off me when he, he hit the ground like as if somebody had threw him out of an aeroplane. And uh, I think Wally thought he was gone. I did too. That, that's the kind of thing you see happening and you can't believe you see, you're seeing it. He's lying on the ground, blood gurgling out of his throat, making strangled noises in his heels, drumming <clears throat> the ground. <clears throat> Uh, let me think. Some fellow with a car was taking his kids for a picnic and he tipped them out of the car and put me in the, in the car after I'd been shot and run me straight into Brankston. Police were ordered to fire into the ground and into the air. Um, there was much argument about that. The bullet that killed Norman Brown appeared to have been a ricochet. There were marks on it that were said by an expert to be gravel marks, but um, miners claimed that those marks were caused by fingernail impressions in the lead. The day of the funeral, you couldn't have dropped the cigarette paper here, you know, the, oh, crowd, yes. the crowd that were here. That's true, yes. And the bloke was officiating. Yeah. You remember him saying, yeah. the dead aren't crying for revenge. Yes. And the crowd grilled back, give us guns. There was a very simple man, honest and quiet, yet he became the mate of every working man. And every miner knows his name. Oh, Norman Brown, oh, Norman Brown, the murdering coppers, they shot him down, they shot him down in Rothbury Town. A working man called Norman Brown An honest man, the parson said And dropped the clods upon his head But honest man or not, he's dead To live forever, Norman Brown There was a terrific reaction in Sydney and round the state there were huge meetings of protest in the domain called by the New South Wales Trades and Labor Council and the Labor Party. Jack Lang was the leader of the Labor Party, at the state Labor Party leader, and uh, he opposed what Scullin Federal Labor Party was doing and so on. So there was a terrific public reaction <clears throat> to what was going on, and for once, public opinion was on the side of the miners. Well, for the next six months, you know, it's not an exaggeration to say there's a reign of terror that from Maitland to Cessnock, from December to June, there were police wagons with eight police on board sitting four back to back. And they passed what was called the Unlawful Assemblies Act. So if more than three people were standing in the street talking about cricket, the weather or whatever, it was an unlawful assembly. It was in Curry and Cessnock, but not in Vaucluse and Rose Bay. Uh, <clears throat> they get off these wagons and batten you into the ground. When the uh, patient gang came over the hill and their sidecars and cars and bikes, uh, Dad was right in line. And when they stopped, they um, grabbed Dad and uh, he, was a, he was a fighter. He fought them. And some, some of the chap told us later, uh, afterwards that there was about five coppers with their truncheons building Dad into insensibility. They brought him unconscious. The depression was developing. Some of the mines that were still working were closing down because of the loss of markets due to the approaching depression. <clears throat> so it became quite clear it was an impossible position. The Federal Labor government was going to do nothing. <clears throat> the Bavin government was going to do all it could, acting as the agents of the employers. And after 15 months, <clears throat> everybody was just too exhausted to keep it going. But it wasn't an easy return to work, <clears throat> where normally there'd be aggregate meetings of the miners from all the pits combined to reach those decisions. <clears throat> the situation was so tense it was decided each miner's lodge would make its own decision. 
And I recollect the big meeting at Rich Remain, the Rich Remain <coughs> Lodge. Uh, the decision to go back to work was only carried by about 100 votes, <coughs> majority. And instead of taking a show of hands, or the motion on the voices, <coughs> the chairman called for an immediate division. All those in favour of return to work on my left, all those against on my right. <coughs> so like the Red Sea, they divided. And uh, it wasn't a sound. Both sides just stared at each other. And somebody from the no side called out, where's Norman Brown now? That's all it was said. What you've got to realise is, those blokes have been through 1940 and 18, 1921 in the old country, 1926 in the old country, <coughs> and <coughs> out here with the native born, they knew that the owners had broken the law, they knew that the courts had ruled the owners had broken the law, they knew the Crown Solicitor in New South Wales had advised the government the owners had broken the, had broken the law, the government had threatened to prosecute John Brown because he'd broken the, the law, everything pointed to them breaking the law, and here they were under police fire. The miners were under police fire. And I don't think any section of the Australian population in the whole of our history has ever been put through anything like that. We've never forgiven them for that and we will never forgive them. And the system itself will suffer, the capitalist system, as a result. They do the things that uh, are contrary to their maintenance of their power. It'll go. Well, I think it was a lesson to the government and a lesson to the miners too. It's um, something that we've seen before, seen afterwards with the English coal strikes, for instance. Um, I don't think anyone gains by a strike. And uh, in the case of Rothbury, well, the miners finally went back on the terms that they were offered. You can't go through that. You can't go through that without it getting inside you. And, uh, if it had to happen, <clears throat> you know, thing like that had to happen. If somebody said, do you want to go through that? I'd say, no, I don't want to go through that. But this might be a contradiction. If it had to happen, I'm, I'm glad I had that experience. Well, I don't know. I can't help as much because uh, I'm getting too old and can't remember, you know. But I remember we was in there grand ideas of uh, grabbing the scabs and we, we did no good there and uh, instead of that the police knocked some of us off. A miner's pick is in his hand His song is shouted through the land A land that's free and broad and brown The land that bred us Norman Brown Oh Norman They shot him down in Rothbury Town, a working man called 